moratorium that allows lethal research. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. At the time of this broadcast, the Senate's voting on the second of three procedural votes to end the health care debate, moving Democrats one step closer to passing a major health care bill by Christmas Eve. On Monday, Democrats secured a crucial victory shortly after 1 a.m. on a party-line vote of 60 to 40 to end a Republican filibuster of the bill. President Obama hailed the vote as historic and congratulated lawmakers for what he said was defying special interests. The United States Senate knocked down a filibuster aimed at blocking a final vote on health care reform and scored a big victory for the American people. By standing up to the special interests who have prevented reform for decades and who are furiously lobbying against it now, the Senate has moved us closer to reform that makes a tremendous difference for families, for seniors, for businesses, and for the country as a whole. The president claims lawmakers stood up to special interests, but a new study tells a very different story. The study is published in the Chicago Tribune. It reveals how health care lobbyists have influenced and shaped health care reform and find there's a, quote, revolving door between Capitol Hill staffers and lobbying jobs for companies with a stake in health care legislation. According to the study, at least 166 former congressional aides involved in shaping health care legislation have registered to lobby for health care companies, and that health care companies have spent $635 million on lobbying over the past two years. The study is based on an analysis of public documents by Northwestern University's Medill News Service in partnership with the Tribune Newspaper's Washington Bureau and the Center for Responsive Politics. Andrew Zajac is the reporter who wrote the story for the Chicago Tribune. He's the national correspondent for the Tribune newspapers, and he joins us from Washington, D.C. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Andrew. Just explain to us what you found. We looked at uh, uh, former employees of uh, the, the five key committees who were, uh, which were involved in shaping health care legislation, people who in, in the past had worked for those committees. Uh, and match those identifications with uh, lobbying registrations. That's how we got at the number of, I think it's 166 uh, former staffers and 13 former members uh, of those committees that are involved in, in um, lobbying uh, 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 health care issues. Talk about the significance of the number of staffers from, well, in the House. Uh, you talk about the House Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer and significantly in the Senate, the Senate Finance Committee chair, uh, Max Baucus. Right. There's—I um, I think the overall—this is kind of an old story. People have been making a living through the revolving door in increasing numbers for probably the last 30 years. It's a relatively recent phenomenon in, in Washington, but it is established now, and it's, it's, it's an established career path. You put in your time on the Hill and then you move out as a, a, a lobbyist. You have a brief cooling-off period. I think there's a year or two where you can't lobby your former bosses. Uh, but essentially, you, you move out, and you can double or triple or even maybe quadruple your salary. But in this instance, I think the, the, the what's significant um, is that uh, there's, a, there's already a dominance of, of business and corporate interests in, in lobbying in Washington. They already have the edge in the sense that they're the best funded. They're the greatest number of groups. They're, they take up a lot of the oxygen. And on top, they've, they've magnified their advantage. The, the impact of um, these people working uh, for um, these special interests, for pharmaceutical companies and hospitals and doctors and so forth, is it magnifies the advantage that corporate interests have, and it squeezes out room for other kinds of conversation. A lot of opinion polls show that a majority of Americans would have liked a public option, for example. That simply wasn't going to be feasible, uh, given the, the sheer array, the power and the, the, the resources that the corporate interests could bring to bear, including being able to hire all of these insiders who have the connections and the understanding of how the Hill works. It has the effect of magnifying the advantages that corporate interests have and also of sort of shrinking the playing field for the available options, the available alternatives for how we fix health care. You quote Bob Edgar, president of Common Cause, um, uh, blaming a toxic cocktail of insiders and money for short-circuiting a government-run plan that would have competed with private insurers. Right. Uh, there's a, there are two things going on here. One, you have the, the money to hire uh, the, the top-shelf lobbyists, but then, in addition, those lobbyists come 
bearing uh, your gifts, the, the resources, the campaign resources of uh, their, their clients. So it's a, a, a kind of a double whammy. You have the expertise, but then you also have uh, the campaign contributions that uh, these corporate interests can can uh, can also bring with them, and this is also reflective of the system that we have in Washington. Uh, we don't have uh, public financing of campaigns, and they over the last uh, 30 or so years, coinciding with the rise of the, this sort of growing professional class of lobbyists, uh, you have increasingly expensive political campaigns. So you have these lawmakers who need to raise money. That's just the reality, and these are the interests that have it. So uh, not only are they dealing with familiar.